Hello everybody and welcome back to the World War II Mysteries and Obscurities Iceberg. Today we're going to be covering the second tier of the iceberg. Uh, this one's got a little bit more to it and it's definitely it definitely goes back to some weird uh, occultish kind of stuff. Uh, not too heavy on it. I think that'll come in the uh, next tier uh, but I'm not 100% certain on that one. The last one had some really heavy topics to talk about this one not so much in fact it's got some pretty comedic topics to talk about which the last one had a one <laughs> this one has a couple anyways let's just go ahead and jump right into it uh, but before i do i want to go ahead and mention the fact that i did say that all of these were going to be on a separate channel but that is a lie and i've decided that i'm just going to upload the when i finish all of these and i decide to compile them into one big video uh no cuts no nothing no endings like all that when i compile it into one big video that's when i'll upload it to my second channel but for the most part, everything else will be on this channel here, which I know it's going to be really weird because this is like my gaming channel and my shitpost channel. So yeah, it just doesn't make much sense. But uh, I've I said I was going to be a variety channel anyway. So fuck you. So the very first one on this list <laughs> is one that I actually really enjoy talking about because it's so it's it's pretty stupid. But it's it's pretty um, it's pretty interesting. So Nazi super soldiers. <laughs> I know just immediately saying the words Nazi super soldiers is it's it's hilarious all right super soldiers like that's that's the stuff of like legend the, the stuff of myth like pe people make that shit up it's it's like comic book type shit but the the Nazis believed that if they injected certain drugs into uh, into their soldiers they'd become um Super soldiers, uh, able to uh, just pretty much just fight forever, uh, is what they they determined. And the the funny thing is exactly what they put in this drug. So first of all, the drug's name is D I X D dash I X, but which I'm pretty sure is D nine. Uh, I don't know if D is a Roman numeral for anything. If it is, I feel fucking stupid. For Roman numerals, that's just five hundred and nine. But I'm not 100% certain on that because the Wikipedia doesn't like translate it to like actual numbers. So I assume that's not it. Anyways, the fun part is what D9 consisted of. I actually kind of prefer calling it D9 versus like 509 or anything. I don't know. It just it sounds cool. D9 was a performance enhancing drug that consisted of <laughs> five milligrams of oxycodone five milligrams of cocaine and three milligrams of methamphetamine <laughs> susan i just want you to know that this is this is entirely just it's it's a history lesson okay i'm sure talking about drugs will get me striked especially within the very first the, the very first thing of this video first like minute or so this pill didn't really see much use during world war ii because it was finished developing pretty much uh, after the end of World War II, or really just like the day before it ended, I guess. But they did test it, obviously. And th this is why I keep looking back at my phone because I have to, I, I have to read this, okay? This is the very, th they tested this on some people. And according to German researchers, supposedly they found that test subjects who had used the drug could march in a circle for up to 90 kilometers, which is 55 miles for us Americans, per day without rest while carrying a 20 kilogram or 44 pound for us Americans backpack. Now, I'm not sure how true that is, but if that's the case, I kind of I kind of want that drug. I mean, that's, that sounds pretty cool. Susan, that was a joke. That was that was a joke. I meant in Minecraft. I, I want to try the drug in Minecraft. So Operation Downfall was essentially nearing the end of World War II and prior to the surrender of Japan, the Allied forces had actually devised a plan to invade Japan. They they wanted to invade Japan because Japan versus literally all the other Axis powers was not surrendering because y you know like I said about Japan they're um they're very very 
uh, heavy on honor, and it's not very honorable to surrender. Anyways, but what's really interesting about this, right, is this was a plan. This was never executed. This was just a, an operation that they planned to execute, but they didn't because the Japanese actually surrendered, despite them being very, like... Despite this being something they didn't expect them to do. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, they never followed through with this operation. But the Wikipedia page for it kind of makes it seem like it actually happened. Because it's a very long Wikipedia page. In fact, it's way longer than some of the stuff that actually happened that I've already covered. And some of the stuff that I will cover. For instance, and I don't know if this is just part of, uh, you know, wartime planning, but they had an estimated casualties section, which estimated, uh, let me, let me see here, uh, hundreds of thousands of civilians. <laughs> and because they were like, well, if we're going to be invading Japan, knowing Japan, they're probably, even the civilians are probably going to fight back. They're, they're probably going to arm themselves and fight back. So... Uh, yeah, those, they're probably gonna die. And, and look, I could honestly make a video on Operation Downfall that would probably take up two to three hours long. That is how much is in that Wikipedia page. It's insane. All you really need to know is that it was predicted that the Americans would be fighting, or sorry, the Allies would be fighting over 35 million, uh, people when invading Japan, which is like 31 million civilians and 4 million troops. So, uh, yeah. Moving on from that, the Mystery Division. The Mystery Division, which is uh, honestly just sounds like some kind of fucking Scooby-Doo shit. The Mystery Division, or the 12th Armored Division of the United States was an armored division that fought in the European Theater of Operations in France. Now, the, the Germans actually gave them a really cool nickname, uh, other than the nickname given to them, which was the Mystery Division. The Germans gave them the nickname the Suicide Division for the insane shit that they would do. Now, before I get into the list of some of the things that they are known for, I have to mention that one of them will be left out as it will be brought up again later on in the video. They outfought two crack German divisions for 12 days, forced the Germans from their last stronghold in French territory by liberating Colmar, cleared the entire Saar Pal I hate this word, Saar Palinate of the enemy in less than a week. They went from Rhine to Austria in 37 days, capturing 63,013 people. I, I guess Nazis, I'm not entirely sure, because it doesn't say. Uh, they captured in... <laughs> They captured intact the first bridge across the Danube, thus setting up the bridgehead, which led to the final campaign of the ETO, or the European Theater of Operations, like I said before. And they liberated five concentration camps, all satellite camps of Dachau, I don't know how to pronounce that word, near Landsberg Prison, where Adolf Hitler wrote Mein Kampf. And they did quite a bit of stuff. Yeah, uh, they have a site that's dedicated to all of the stuff that they did. And what I find the most interesting is just that the, the site looks like a really shitty PowerPoint, but it's cute. It's super cute. And like, uh, I can't, I can't get mad. But like I said, keep these guys in mind because they are going to come back up later on in the iceberg. In fact, pretty soon. Next up is one that I, uh, I, I bought a drink for as a bit, as you can tell. It is Fanta. Uh, I recorded this already. Thankfully, I bought four fucking bottles so I can make this bit uh, happen more than once. This is really hard. One sec. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna cut to when I open the bottle. Don't you want to? <laughs> Shit. Don't you want to? Want a Fanta? Is that how the ad goes? I don't remember. During the start of World War II, or at least during 1941, which is around the time that the United States got uh, kind of brought into the war, we did a little thing that we did pretty recently, which is we set an embargo on Germany. And we pretty much cucked the, uh, the Coca-Cola factories in Germany out of being able to make coca-cola because well coca-cola is manufactured in the united states and so the syrup that they needed for coca-cola was 
plucked from them, kept from them, because, well, we set an embargo because literally Nazis. <laughs> so, yeah, because of this, the uh, the president of the Germany factory, the, the German Coca-Cola, decided, well, I can't make Coca-Cola anymore, so I might as well make a new drink. And so he came up with Fanta and... Uh, it was actually really, it sold really well in Germany, surprisingly, and it sold pretty well in other, like, Axis powers, or, like, other countries that are part of the Axis powers, and because of this, you know, it, it would, it pretty much ha held a legacy for up until 1949, where it was discontinued because, well, they could finally start making Coca-Cola again, so why keep on making this lesser thing, you know, Fanta, when you could keep on making Coca-Cola finally, which is what they did. So because of the fact that, like I said, they can make Coca-Cola again, they discontinued Fanta, but it wouldn't be recontinued until, I believe, 1965, 19... It, I'll throw up on the screen when it is that it uh, was, you know, when it when it was finally continued. But you need to know is the orange flavor that everybody has, that everybody knows of Fanta, was not the original flavor of Fanta. The original was supposed to be closer to Coca-Cola. However, the Italians decided, well, what if we just made it its own unique kind of flavor. Maybe we just make it like a an orange flavor. And honestly, it works pretty well. Like anyone who knows Fanta knows it as the orange flavor that it has now. In 2015, they re they re-released for I believe it was like the 20th, 25th year anniversary of Fanta or something, the uh, the original flavor of Fanta. And honestly, I can't find anything on that. Next up is another thing that was actually pretty fucking hard to do any research on. And it's kind of fair because as you can see, the title is pretty vague. It, the title is Unknown Nazi Photographers. Okay, that's cool unknown Nazi photographers? What do you mean? Like, by unknown Nazi photographers, you mean Nazis who were photographers and nobody knew who those Nazis were? Or photographers that nobody knew that took pictures of Nazis? Regardless, it was really hard to find any information on this, and so I do apologize. It is a little short. But there was something that I did find that was pretty interesting. I, I have to look at this to try and remember what the f like try to try to find a way to pronounce this because it's pretty hard. The Sonder 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 Commando Sonder Commando I don't fucking know something like that. The Sonder Commando photographs were pretty much what piqued my interest in this entire thing. But they were they were photos that were taken inside of concentration camps and there's only like four of them and they're pretty blurry and I imagine the reason is because well whoever took them probably wasn't supposed to have you know a camera took the photos and then was killed for it but that's my assumption I don't really know because there's not much on this even on the fucking wikipedia for it the Niihau incident I am not Hawaiian obviously like I've said I am white, so my pronunciation on these things, not the best, but that is, from what I could find, the way to pronounce it. The Niihau incident occurred during the days of Nist <laughs> occurred during the days of December 7th to the 13th of 1941. And as you could tell by the dates that I mentioned there, which uh, mainly was December 7th, you can tell that this was related to Pearl Harbor. Essentially what happened is one of the pilots, uh, let me go ahead and pull up his name here because I am very bad at remembering names, especially when they're of foreign language. One of the pilots, Shigenori Nishikaichi, that is the best you're going to get out of me. I took three and a half years of Japanese, but I'm still really shit at it. Crash landed his plane in the island of Niihau. The Japanese Navy had actually designated the Niihau Island as an uninhabited island. So they pretty much thought, oh, well, nobody really lives on this island. So uh, just land your planes there, set up a flare, and we'll come and pick you up as soon as we can after the attacks of Pearl Harbor. Well, believe it or not, the island wasn't uninhabited. It was... It, it, it was habited that there were people. <laughs> so 
this man, Nishikaichi, crash landed into the island of Ni'ihau, and the residents of Ni'ihau were like, well, shit, we don't actually speak Japanese, but we have a couple of residents on this island that do speak Japanese from Japan, and they could help translate. So they took Nishikaichi to the person who could translate, and first of all, the the natives of Nish the natives of Ni'ihau Island were pretty friendly at first with Nishikaichi. After they had translations done by the res the Japanese resident, they found out that Nishikaichi is responsible for, or well, the Japanese and Nishikaichi took part in the attacks on Pearl Harbor. Which, first of all, the people of Ni'ihau did not know what the incident of Pearl Harbor was because it had literally just happened. However, as Hawaiian, oh, however, as Hawaii is technically part of America, I mean, I say technically, it is literally part of America. They were not too fond of Nishikaichi because of this. And they said, look, you can live in this island. You can live with the Japanese residents. However, we're going to have to keep guard on you because we don't want you turning on us because we're all Americans here technically. So he went and he lived with those residents under guard but he told the people that he was with, the two Japanese residents that he was with, essentially hey, I want to get the fuck out of here. Here's why we were bombing the fuck out of Pearl Harbor will you help me? And they were like yeah dude will help you so they killed the guards and they went to the plane and they destroyed it and uh well um they got caught and the dude who helped out nishikaichi seppuku <laughs> and nishikaichi uh died in prison so uh, it, it was pretty fucked up, the fact that they killed the guard, because they probably didn't need to do that. Uh, but also, I mean, I don't think they would have been able to, you know, Nishikaichi wouldn't have been able to escape regardless. Uh, the wife of the man who killed himself obviously was grieving, and she said, I just wanted to help the man. He, he's, see, I felt bad for him, and I just wanted to help him because I felt bad. Her husband, on the other hand, because of this, a lot of Hawaiians were pretty distrustful towards the Japanese that were residents of the Hawaiian Islands because, well, the situation kind of showed that no matter how Americanized you were, even if you were a Japanese citizen, you were still loyal to Japan. So what's stopping everybody who was a Japanese citizen that was on that island from doing something similar and just attacking the natives of the island of Hawaiian islands. Well, look, it, it didn't really matter because nothing came out of it other than the Ni'ihau incident. And really surprisingly, uh, many Japanese citizens of the Hawaiian islands were spared from being put in internment camps. So yeah, so a while back in the first tier, I talked about the uh, Germans escape to Argentina. Now, something that I didn't say, or I might have said, but as far as I recall, I didn't say, is that this was part of a thing called rat lines. Now, rat lines were, <laughs> it's a funny name, uh, rat lines. Anyways, Rat lines were essentially escape routes for the Nazis to escape Europe and go to countries where they were safer. For instance, Brazil, Argentina, Antarctica, because like I said, who the fuck is the leader of Antarctica? Uh, there was a couple of others here. Let me go ahead and make sure I got the list correct. Um, Paraguay, Colombia, Brazil, Uruguay, Mexico, Chile, Peru, Guatemala, Ecuador, and Bolivia. And surprisingly, also on that list is the United States, which is really weird because why the fuck would the United States, who probably hated Germany the second most, why the fuck would they accept the Germans into, you know, like with welcome arms and be like, hey, fuck, come here. Yeah, hell yeah. Well, you can you can be here. Interesting. 
But that might be because of something that happened that we're about to get into, which is actually a really fun topic to talk about. So, the Battle of Castle Itter. Now, I've actually heard about the Battle of Castle Itter before, thanks to a band that I actually really like, which I know looking at me, you probably wouldn't think that I like this band, but Sabaton, <laughs> because of a song that they, na they made titled The Last Stand. Now, when doing research for this, I mainly just read the Wikipedia article, so there are, that's why a, a few things, uh, in this, I ended up getting wrong. So on the 3rd of May of 1945, an imprisoned Yugoslav communist resistance member from Croatia left the castle under the pretext of performing an errand for the prison's commander. The man whose name I honestly, I can't pronounce it, but I try, I, I'm not, I'm not even going to try because I'm, I, I'm not good at it. Anyways. Um, so essentially this Yugoslav, uh, Yugoslavian communist resistance member uh had this letter that essentially said hey we're all being kept captive in this prison can you help us and he was supposed to go give it to like the nearest um american soldier or whatever that he just so happened to run into um but while this was happening the commander of the prison was like well I'm probably going to get executed because I'm a fucking SS officer. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and dip the fuck out for my safety. But before he did that, he said, I'm also going to go ahead and order the execution of every single French prisoner within this. Every other guard, every other German Nazi, every other guard within this building also left. So the French prisoners did what any fucking prisoner would do in this situation and they took over the castle. So they essentially just had the entire castle to themselves, but instead of leaving for whatever reason, they just decided to stay there. Uh, but also probably because they were afraid of all of the SS members that continued to roam the parts. And also Castle Itter was like a checkpoint for most of the SS. So yeah, probably not the best idea to leave when you are supposed to be executed, all of you. So you're yeah, probably better to stay put and wait for help to arrive. However, as it was taking quite a while for the uh, original Yugoslavian prisoner to come back, they decided, all right, well, I guess we'll go ahead and send the Czech cook out to go find the closest person uh, the, the closest non-SS person that he can find and ask for help. So he ran into the German Wehrmacht <laughs> and he said, hey, we're, uh, we're about to be executed by the SS. And it just so happened he came up to somebody who was part of the German Wehrmacht that uh, was a part of a company that were uh, disillusioned, uh, that didn't really... Uh, really care much for the nazis anymore especially now that uh, the the nazi regime was coming to a close so they were like well sure i guess we'll go ahead and help you out it was hundreds if i recall correctly of german wehrmacht soldiers going to go help out uh, in this effort uh, they all went back to the castle but alongside this was uh i'm pretty sure his name was andre the, uh, the original prisoner who was supposed to go uh, find Americans, uh, who just so happened to uh, find a tank battalion. However, there weren't very many. There were like maybe 10, 19. Uh, that was a big jump, but yeah, that's about as many as there were for this. Um, and uh, he comes back, and obviously all of the French prisoners are a little upset because the help that they are getting is very few Americans with like one or two tanks and a shit ton of fucking German Wehrmacht when their enemy right now are the Germans, but it's the SS. Regardless, the German Wehrmacht and the American soldiers band together with the French all in a fucking castle defending themselves as hundreds of SS soldiers storm the castle. And, um, Starting with SS Panzer, S Panzer, SS Panzer. That's that's as much as you're gonna get out of me. Uh, firing at the building, so yeah, they were a little scared. 
However, after a few hours of battling between them, uh, actually, you know what? I, I want to I want to mention something that I found very important was that uh, originally when it started, the I'm pretty sure it was like Colonel Lee or whatever, very American name, uh, <laughs> told the told some of the French prisoners to stay back and you know not get sh not get shot. Um, however, they were like, "No, nah, we're we're gonna help out." Oh, fuck you. Uh, there's some really interesting stories, like for instance, the um, the athlete that I had mentioned, the uh, the the Olympic gymnast or whatever, uh, was like, I am going to pretty much do a suicide run where I'm going to go ahead and lead the tanks this way, uh, and he managed to succeed. He didn't die. That man did not fucking die, um, and he just like he was in the matrix just dodging bullets because he was just that much of an athlete it's fucking insane that story um but absolutely recommend going and watching wendigoon's video on it uh, i had recorded originally up the part where i talked about it before he released the video then he released a video on this subject and i was like well fuck <laughs> But anyways, uh, after a few hours, they got a call through the telephone at the castle from uh, uh, some uh, some U.S. reinforcements, and they were like, oh, what the fuck's going on? And Colonel Lee is just like, yeah, we're getting fucked over here. Can you please come help us? And sure enough, like, they come and they, they just defeat the SS within a matter of seconds. And uh, it's a really cool story. It's, it's really awesome, the banding of, like, the, the, the German Wehrmacht and the uh, U.S. soldiers. Uh, really cool story. Again, highly recommend you go and watch uh, Wendigoon's video on it because it's in a lot more detail than what I could possibly put out there. Anyways, moving on. As if my hatred for French people was acknowledged by this uh, beautiful iceberg, it just so happens we get another one. So... Who betrayed Jean Moulin? Jean, Jean, Jean Pierre Paul Norif? I don't know. Um, so Jean Pierre Moulin, Moulin, Jean Pierre Moulin. <laughs> We're just gonna start pronouncing things like a, like the fucking American I am, because that's what I should do. Jean Pierre Moulin was a French civil servant and resistant who served as the first president of the National Council of the Resistance during World War II from the 23rd of May 1943 until his death less than two months later. On the 21st of June of 1943, Jean Moulin was arrested as well as several other resistance members during a meeting that they were having in the home of Dr. Friedrich Dujon, 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 I don't know, here's the fucking name on the screen. Somebody who knows French, please tell me. Who was also arrested, by the way. Jean, or Jean-Pierre. Jean-Pierre was, um arrested, taken to prison, and tortured horribly by guards. And when I say he was tortured horribly, let me go ahead and get into a little bit of a description of what it was that happened to him. According to witnesses, the Gestapo would take, would take Jean-Pierre and his men, and they had their fingernails removed using hot needles as spatulas. In addition, his fingers were placed in the doorframe of the interrogation cell, with the door then repeatedly closed until his knuckles were shattered. They increasingly tightened his handcuffs until they penetrated his skin, breaking the bones in his wrists. He was beaten until his face was unrecognizable and he fell into a coma. The last time that he was seen alive, he was still in a coma. His head had swollen and was yellow from the bruising, and he was wrapped in bandages. There's a lot of uncertainty surrounding his death and what exactly was the cause. Obviously, the cause was the beating, and it was really hard to tell when exactly it was that he died because the death certificate never told anybody when he died. The real question here though is who is it that betrayed Jean-Pierre? Who is it that told authorities where it was that he was when he was? Well, nobody really knows, but obviously there's speculation as to who it was. Obviously the speculation is that it was somebody who was there at the meeting, many people point to it being the doctor that 
was holding the thing. Um, Rene Hardy, who, just like the doctor, was arrested by the Gestapo, but was later let go, or was allowed to flee, essentially. The Victor Goddard incident. Um, so this one's a little... <laughs> This one's funny to me uh, because this is just stupid fucking occult shit. Essentially, th this is just one of those crazy old men who was just like, yeah, so uh, I believe in ghosts and I've got some stories to tell you and they're ghost stories. The first one being something that actually is corroborated by many other people, which was that one of the people that he uh, was flying with, one of the people he taught to fly, uh, I do not recall his name, uh, had passed away and they were all uh, him and pretty much all of the, uh, the the people who were under the same training unit I, I don't know military terms anyways a lot of the people who also knew him showed up to his funeral and they all were like hey let's go ahead and take a picture and what's really scary is in that picture you can see the dead pilot in the background like he's just passing by he's like hey what's up uh, you see his face. It's really fucking scary. However, I don't know of any other pictures that exist of him other than that picture. So I can't really say if that is him because uh, I, I couldn't find anything. Anyways, moving on is the thing that is the thing that <sighs> the reason why this is on the iceberg. There we go. The reason why this is on the iceberg, in 1935, Victor had an incident in which he flew over a Scottish airfield that was abandoned. Now, when he flew over this airfield, he saw that A, like I said, it was abandoned, but B, a lot of the, uh, the there was no aircrafts and a lot of the uh, containers, the units in which you would usually store aircrafts were all run down in pretty shit condition. But he flew around for a bit and then rain appeared and he was like oh fuck there's rain so he turned around got the fuck out of there but what was really interesting is he said he continued to fly through the rain until he appeared on the other side of the rain but ended up back at the airfield but what was interesting is not only did he show back up at, not only did he end up back at the airfield but the airfield was in perfect condition and it was operating and he said that he saw aircraft, but the aircraft were all painted yellow, which is a very interesting and small detail because later, uh, several, no, not several, because this is in 35. So uh, maybe like uh, a few years later, that airfield would end up being put back into operation and all of the aircraft that were originally silver were painted yellow, which again, like I said, is a very minor detail and it's it's something that's like okay why would they do that you know i don't know pretty strange that man flew through time i guess foo fighters not to be mistaken with the uh, same name as dave Grohl's band uh foo fighters but foo fighters were essentially like ufos before we came up with the term ufos uh before we came up with the term flying saucer really but that's essentially what they were uh they were a bunch of like sightings of like what we would assume are aliens or what they assumed at the time to be german aircraft or just really anything from the access powers that they haven't been able to identify beforehand so yeah there's <laughs> there's that but a lot of them were kind of unexplainable phenomena that you would usually today be like oh it's that's an alien or you'd be like oh you know, it's, it's a UFO or like what the government wants you to say, a UAP. What the fuck is a, a WAP? Royal Air Force personnel had reported seeing lights following their aircraft from as early as March of 1942. With similar sightings involving RAF bomber crews over the Balkan Islands starting in April 1944. American sightings were first recorded by crews from the 422nd Night Fighter Squadron. By the way, that's a cool fucking name, the Night Fighter Squadron. Holy shit! I want to be a part of that. Sign me up. They were stationed in occupied Belgium during the first week of October that same year. The Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force in Paris issued an official statement that the phenomenon was a new German weapon, quote unquote, a new German weapon. Sure it was. 
In a January 15th, 1945 edition of Time Magazine, they carried a story titled Foo Fighter, in which it reported that the balls of fire had been following the USAAF night fighters for over a month and that the pilots had named it the Foo Fighters. According to Time Magazine, descriptions of the phenomena varied, but the pilots agreed that the mysterious lights followed their aircraft closely at high speed. The balls of fire phenomenon reported from the Pacific Theater of Operations differed somewhat from the Foo Fighters that were reported from Europe. The ball of fire resembled a large burning sphere that just hung in the sky. It just, it just, it just, so it just sat there. Though so it was reported to sometimes follow aircraft. Ooh, spooky aliens! There was speculation that the phenomena could be related to the Japanese fire balloon campaign. As with the European Foo Fighters, no aircraft were reported as having been attacked by a ball of fire. There were many occasions of these supposed Foo Fighters during World War II, which I actually I find that to be really interesting that there were many occasions of which this happened. You know, I mean, like World War II was like the war. I don't really know how else to word it, but like it's it's the one that really it feels like held a massive turning point for the world as it is like as it is today world war ii feels like a massive turning point for literally everything that you have to deal with today and frank's diary was edited now this is a very little known fact but it is a fact indeed and frank's diary was edited now whether who it's by is a little Eh, it's it's kind of a theory as to who it's by, but in reality, according to Anne Frank's father, the person who edited her own diary was her herself, Anne Frank. She edited her diary supposedly because she overheard a radio station saying that anyone who just so happens to have family members that own a diary, that, you know, Jewish family members that own a diary to keep those so that way they could later be published so on frank was just like oh fuck i've said some pretty horrible things in my diary might as well go back and uh, scribble those out and edit it and make it perfect for uh, being published which just i don't know doesn't sound right and even to her father he was like oh, you use some words that i didn't expect my daughter to use for her age but that's okay and so he also made some edits because he was like well you know i do want my daughter's diary to be published so he made a couple of edits according to himself uh which those were and let me go ahead and say because i like this uh some of the things he specifically he specifically edited out was a passage in which she <laughs> she describes her classmates as everything from a detestable, sneaky, stuck-up, two-faced gossip to pretty boring. So in other words, uh, yeah. The person who edited Anne Frank's diary was herself, supposedly, and also her father, supposedly. The Battle of Los Angeles, which is honestly the coolest fucking name ever. The Battle of Los Angeles just sounds, I don't know why, super cool. Uh, in my head, I thought, oh, the Battle of Los Angeles. Like, this is this is when I was first learning about it, like, a long fucking time ago. Uh, when we talked about the Battle of Los Angeles, it was because of the fact that, and I kind of don't really want to spoil it, but the person who taught me it in, like, uh, I want to say, like, middle school or whatever, she covered it because of the fact that she herself supposedly encountered a UFO. Now, I'm not going to call her some crazy lady, but she was kind of a crazy lady. But because of this, she was super into UFOs. So crazy UFO lady tells us a story about the Battle of Los Angeles and says, what do you think it was? I think it was aliens. What do you think? So the Battle of Los Angeles, which I haven't gotten into yet, is essentially back in 1942. Two. I want to go ahead and make sure I'm 100% on that, but I could be very wrong. Yes, I was right. February 5th, February 25th of 1942. So just imagine this, right? You're in your bed. You're living in Los Angeles. First of all, why would you? But anyways, who cares? First of all, you, you just, you're just in bed. It's nighttime. And all of a sudden you hear a bunch of sirens going off and you're like, well, a little fucking strange. Those are loud air raid sirens. Wonder what the fuck is going on. But an air raid, I assume, because of the sirens. 
And next thing you know, an entire blackout just wipes the city of Los Angeles. Okay, it's a little weird. Next thing you know, you see spotlights in the fucking sky. And boom, 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 boom. Just a, a fucking insane amount of artillery going off into the sky. Weird. Very weird situation. And this goes on until like at least seven in the morning when eventually the power goes back on and the air raid sirens are done. And um, you're like, what the fuck just happened? So at 2.25 a.m. was when the... Uh, the blackout occurred, and then around... <sighs> Sorry, I need to make sure I get these all correct. At around 3.16 a.m. is when all of the the artillery started going off, like 50 caliber machine guns and like 12-inch mortars, <laughs> like anti-aircraft sh shells being fired into the air. By the way, 1,400 total rounds were fired into the air that day. An insane amount at, by the way, absolutely nothing. Anyways, at around 4.14 a.m. is when the all of the artillery stopped, the air raid stopped, and around 7.17 a.m. is when the, uh, the blackout was lifted. So for an entire f almost five hours, people were without power and probably very, very fucking confused as to what just happened for two hours straight. The U.S. Office of Chair Force History said that it was a meteorological balloon. God, where have I heard that a million times? A photo that was published in the Los Angeles Times Magazine on February 26, 1942, the day after this had happened. It kind of just, um, it really, it really, really helped with a lot of people who were super into UFOs at the time. Um, and, uh, it, it's, it's seen as hard, hard evidence that UFOs exist. I mean, sure, I guess. <clears throat> but what's really interesting is that the official statement given out by the government was that, well... We were given a false flag that there was going to be an attack on Los Angeles at this time. And of course, because of this, a lot of people kind of panicked. And uh, when they weren't able to see anything, they just, si just sounded the air raid, put on the spotlights and started fucking firing at nothing for two whole hours because of the stress and the fear of getting attacked again after Pearl Harbor. I don't know. I mean, it just sounds a little suspicious. If you want a good video that goes over this entire topic, I would recommend watching Lemmy Know's video, uh, literally titled the bottle, the battle of Los Angeles. And if you haven't already seen it, you absolutely should see it because it is a very good video and it really, really does a lot better of a job talking about this situation than I ever could. The Amber Room. The Amber Room was a, uh, it was a chamber that was decorated with, with amber panels and backed with gold leaf and mirrors. Y you can see the picture here. It's a really interesting room. Uh, just it's gold, amber, very, very, very beautiful. Um, very fancy. But the thing is <laughs> about this room, um, it was built a long time ago. And... Uh, Surprisingly, the uh, over time, the amber became very flaky. Like if you tried to m just move it from one place to another, it was it was absolutely going to disintegrate, for lack of a better term. So there's that, and you need to keep in mind of this uh, because the Nazis decided that they were going to steal the amber room. How the fuck do you steal an entire room? That's a very good question. I don't know, but the Nazis managed to do it. They managed to, to, to steal the room. I imagine they just stole all of the panels and they recreated it in Germany. <laughs> they proceeded to dis <laughs> disassemble and remove parts of the Amber Room. And what's really interesting is before the Nazis had seized the Amber Room, the curators who were responsible for moving the Amber Room, if they ever so needed to, didn't want to move the Amber Room because, like I said beforehand, the, 
the amber had become very brittle and so it was pretty much impossible for anybody to move it so what they did is they just hid it behind some some wallpaper and said yeah no there's no amber room here whoops but the problem is the amber room is a very very well known place a uh, very well known location so the nazis didn't really have a hard time finding it figuring out that oh hey that's just wallpaper getting rid of the wallpaper disassembling the room and then proceeding to steal the fucking amber room i just like how do you how do you steal a room but here's what's here's what's really interesting what's what's amazing is not only did the Nazis proceed to steal the Amber Room, but they proceeded to lose the Amber Room. Because all of the parts for the Amber Room were put onto a train, and then that train disappeared. The Chinese Civil War is super interesting because it has had an impact on China forever. <laughs> the Chinese Civil War has lasted, like the impact has lasted until even today. And I'm sure it will continue to last throughout time for Chinese civilians. Essentially between 1937 and 1945, although it, there was a, f a little bit more of a civil war before this and a, I'm pretty sure more after this, uh, but these are definitely the time periods in which this specific iceberg is talking about. The chairman of the KMT, Chiang Kai-shek, that is the best you're going to get pronunciation for me. I'm not great with Chinese. Chiang Kai-shek really didn't like the CCP. Uh, and he didn't really like communism at all. So he was like, yeah, fuck you, Mao Zedong. And gathered a bunch of Chinese civilians that were also anti-CCP, anti-Mao Zedong. And they were like, all right, we're just going to have a war. Uh, that's, that's the, that's the like short version of it there's a lot more but because of time restraints i'm going to just give you a bare bones version of this essentially even though they were at war with each other the japanese were also like well we want to we want to fucking we want to go to war with you guys but you guys are kind of at war with yourselves so we'll just let that happen it'll it'll solve things out for us so <laughs> The Soviet Union and the United States were both like, well, you know, the Soviet Union sided with the CCP and the United States sided with the KMT. So the Soviet Union went to the went to the CCP to essentially tell them to stop fighting. And the United States also went to the KMT to tell them to stop fighting because they were like, well, if you keep fighting, you're going to give Japan what they want. And you don't really want that, do you? So... Yeah, they they did that, uh, which most people would probably think there's no fucking way that would work. The Soviet Union and the United States, th like they can't if they can't get along, how the fuck are they supposed to make two uh, opposing sides of one country get along? Well, they did for a short period of time, but nonetheless, they, they managed to negotiate peace between the two for a little bit. The Spear of Destiny cool fucking name guys cool fu why does the why does world war ii have so many things with just like cool names except for foo fighters i mean like i guess that's probably a cool name to some people anyways the spear of destiny or the spear of i'm really bad with this one if you've ever watched even gelling you might know the Spear of Destiny, or the Spear of Longinus, or the Holy Spear, whatever name you want to go with, I'm going to go with the Holy Spear because that sounds fucking cool, but so does the Spear of Destiny, I'm going to be honest. Uh, maybe we'll just go with what the, the iceberg wants us to call it, which is the Spear of Destiny. So the Spear of Destiny was the spear that was used to poke Jesus Christ while he was crucified. And it is said in legend that the Spear of Destiny can, be only, can only be broken using the blood of Christ. And it's also said that uh, the Spear of Destiny holds powers, magical powers. Ooh. So um, if you know anything about the Nazis, or at least Hitler, you'll know that Hitler was super into the occult. Super into the occult. I mean, so were quite a bit of the other Nazis, but absolutely Hitler himself was super into it. He wrote in Mein Kampf about it. So... They did what they did with the Amber Room. They stole the Spear of Destiny. <laughs> 
The spirit destiny had been moving around for quite a while, uh, but eventually it landed in one place. And then from that one place, the Nazis were like, Hitler wants that. We want that. Let's go ahead and steal it. Then they buried it under the same, pff, under the same bunker where Hitler shot himself. And uh, it, just like the Amber Room, it's lost. Like the the search for the Spear of Destiny, I believe, is what the uh, the original title or the original name for this is, because obviously the the Nazis were searching for the Spear of Destiny, but also everyone ever since. I just want to go ahead and correct this part. The Spear of Destiny is not missing. However, the shaft of the Spear of Destiny is missing, and I believe it was that the Spear of Destiny went missing, or like the shaft of the Spear of Destiny went missing after World War II. So, yeah. Italian Mafia collaboration. Look, it is no surprise to anyone that the Italian Mafia just so happened to collaborate with the US government during World War II in order to help with the Battle of Sicily, as well as give out uh, any potential spies within New York. That is the short version of it. There's a lot more to it. If you want to just go ahead and Google the title of this, uh, which is the Italian Mafia collaboration, um, you'll find quite a bit. And by quite a bit, I just mean like a couple of things. There's, I mean, when I say quite a bit, I do mean there is quite a bit past these couple of things, but for main purposes, there were just a couple of things, which is, like I said, the Battle of Sicily, as well as the um, searching for any spies that were in New York. Non-Jewish victims in concentration camps. Now, surprisingly, they don't really tell you in school about how victims of the concentration camps would range from not only Jewish, it could be black prisoners, crippled prisoners, uh female prisoners, uh, anyone who was married to a person of Jewish descent, Jehovah's Witnesses, which is kind of fair, literally, literally any minority that was in Germany, Roma Gypsies, anyone who resisted the Nazi regime, anyone who helped a Jew, and so on and so forth. All you'll hear in class is that the Nazis really had it out for the Jews, and so they specifically targeted Jews, which, yes, while that's true, they really targeted any minority. So, yeah. Allied internment camps. So, during World War II and after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Americans reacted by Allied internment camps. So, after Pearl Har after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, many American or Japanese American civilians were put into internment camps. Uh, if I recall correctly, the number was over 120,000 Japanese American civilians were put into internment camps. Now, a lot of people want to try and say that internment camps were pretty much concentration camps, but they weren't, because in reality what they were was to have these civilians that were of Japanese descent be supervised, because thanks to the Niihau incident, it showed that really, no matter how Americanized you were, it is possible that you are still loyal to your government and will still turn a blind eye to the United States. So, in a way, it's kind of fair that they would put these Japanese civilians into internment camps. Yes, it's a little fucked up, but you can understand their mindset when you look at it like that. Now, don't let people tell you that it was only the United States that did it, because as you can tell by this, it is allied. Anyone who was part of the Allied Powers was absolutely responsible for put, for making internment camps as well. Uh, to specifically note, in the Far East, a bunch of Dutch civilians, I, which were mostly from the Netherlands, I believe it was 130,000 to be specific, were put in internment camps. So don't let people tell you it was just the United States and that the United States was the worst for it because it really wasn't not that I'm you know defending anyone here but yeah oh. I really don't know if I'm prepared to talk about the Enigma code but I'm gonna go ahead and try to give it my best uh 
If you want the short version of it, the Enigma code is a cipher that was used to send messages between the Axis powers that was damn near impossible, if not impossible, for the Allied to translate or to decode or to decipher because of the way that it worked. So for the longest time, they were able to make plans to each other and the allied would be able to see these plans but they wouldn't be able to understand what in the fuck it was that they were talking about because to them what it was they were talking about looked like complete fucking gibberish here is a little bit of what it looks like good luck how the fuck did the enigma code or the enigma machine work let's get into it i guess the enigma machine would look pretty much like any normal typewriter would to most people except with the typewriter, you have a paper and you have like the ink blots or whatever, uh, but this doesn't have that. Instead, what this has is all of your letters down here. And then above that is the same set of numbers, only those are to light up for whenever you press a key. So when you would press, say, like, for instance, you press O uh, on that light up screen, it would put Z. And you, you know, to most people, they'd be like, oh, yeah, this is a little weird. I'm typing an O, but it's showing up as Z. But that's the point. That is what it's supposed to do. But if you press O again, it would, instead of going for Z, it would probably go for something like, I don't know, fucking A or N or something. It was completely randomized. <laughs> However, the way that it would work is it had three set three dials on the inside and it was each one was labeled 1 through 26 for you know the 26 letters in the alphabet and you would have to set up those three dials to three specific number or like th a th specific set of three numbers and you with your enigma machine set up to be that way would type in a message and then somebody else with another enigma machine would have to set up theirs the exact same way type in that message that you sent them and from that they would be able to decode what the fuck it was that you said because what you said would look like this gibberish but it would actually be translated to something else which i'm not going to take the time to figure out how to translate the enigma machine i just took the time to figure out how the fuck it works it's actually a very advanced machine for the germans and really just anybody during the 1940s and obviously you can tell cracking this is um it requires more than a human to to be able to decode that and it did it took more than just a human i mean yeah it took one human but you know what that one human had to do he had to create a fucking computer that looks like this shit and and that was able to translate the enigma code and after that that's how they won world war ii against the germans uh yeah very very interesting story very cool how the enigma code just even works because if you take a look at it, you know, you're just like, all right, that's a box. All right, it's got some letters. All right, it's got a second set of letters. When you press one key, it shows up, it lights up another. Uh, it's super weird. And then you look inside of the machine and all the wiring. And it's super, it's just super advanced for the time that it was made in. And even like the, uh, I don't, I, I wish I could remember what the name of it was, but the machine that was created by Alan Turing in order to decipher this code also is pretty advanced for the 1940s. So, yeah, they essentially created a computer in order to translate or to decipher this code. It's a really cool story, and if you haven't seen the imitation game, I highly recommend going and watching that. I did my best with explaining that. I hope it made sense, and I hope I got anything right. Operation Valkyrie was essentially a plan to assassinate Hitler and then after his assassination, after he, he dies, to overthrow the Nazi regime and to arrest all of the Nazis. As you can tell, that didn't go to plan. <laughs> what happened was there were a bunch of people who were... 
associated with the Nazi regime. A lot of them were high-ranking officers, but they didn't really agree with Hitler, uh, and they didn't really agree with the Nazis in general. And so they had the plan to assassinate Hitler because they were so close to him that, you know, they thought they could easily do this. However, <laughs> um, nobody wanted to go through with it. None of the main guys wanted to go through with it. So they were like, all right, maybe we'll talk to some other people who are also close and see if we can get them to do it. But they made sure it was people they actually really trusted with this plan, like people who were like uh, disenfranchised with the Nazis, um, which they got very little of. And uh, nobody wanted to do it. <laughs> That's it. Nobody wanted to do it. But one guy, the person who was really just the spearhead of this entire thing was like, all right, fine. Fuck it. I'll put a bomb in a briefcase, drop it off during a meeting, fuck off out of there, and hopefully it'll kill Hitler. Well, the bomb went off, it killed a few people, but it didn't kill Hitler. It killed a few people, injured a few, injured Hitler, and injured, like, Hitler really just got out of there with, like, a few scratches on his arm. According to the story, uh, it also blew his pants off, which is pretty funny, but in reality, it just blew to smithereens. But he was fine. Nonetheless, but what was funny is even though Hitler wasn't dead, they still proceeded to go on with Operation Valkyrie because the dude who left the bomb was like, all right, he's absolutely going to die with this. So let's just go telling people that Hitler's dead and let's start arresting some Nazis. Well, that didn't really go according to plan because they found out that Hitler wasn't dead and Hitler was calling one of his main homies and being like, hey, Dude, this fucking dude tried to kill me. He put a goddamn bomb in my in my room and he just he's out there. I think I know who it is. And uh well, they arrested the dude, executed him, and executed anyone else who had a you know part in this plan. And uh yeah, it didn't go it didn't go well. So it's the failed assassination attempt of Adolf Hitler, but they got very close. They got very close. It just it just so happens that luck was on Hitler's side and he was not allowed to die that day. Uh, the only way for him to die was to kill himself. So <laughs> anyways, maybe it was to do with the Spear of Destiny because it is said in the uh, the legend of the Spear of Destiny, if you were to ever part with the Spear of Destiny, you would die. Moving on from the failed assassination attempt of Hitler, we have who bombed the Ka who bombed Kasa? Kasa? God, I'm really bad with names and I feel super bad. This is a, this is actually one of those things that is a very huge mystery. And a lot of people think they have the answer to it, but they also kind of really don't. So let me go ahead and get into it, shall we? On June 26th of 1941, the city of Kasa, <laughs> Kasa, Kasa, was bombed by an unidentified aircraft. The attack became the pretext for the government of Hungary to declare war on the Soviet Union the next day. The day of the bombing, which was four days after Germany attacked the Soviet Union in violation of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Non-Aggression Treaty, fucking Christ, as part of Operation Barbosa, or Barbarossa, sorry, my bad, Three unidentified planes bombed the city, killing and wounding dozens of people and causing minor material damage. Numerous buildings were hit, including the local post and telegraph office. Hours after the attack, the Hungarian cabinet passed a resolution calling for the declaration of the existence of a state of war between Hungary and the USSR. Now, essentially, like nobody knows to this day who it is that bombed Casa. Uh, but obviously there's a lot of speculation as to it either being the, like either being the USSR themselves and they just didn't want to take blame for it, I guess, uh, or like some disillusioned members of the USSR that were like, ah, fuck you, or they mistook it for another place that they were supposed to bomb or something. Uh, and other people say that it might have just been the Germans who bombed the USSR in order to make them go to that. If they did, they would get Hungary to go to war with the USSR, which they did and it succeeded. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of speculation as to who it was that did it, but in the end, nobody really knows and nobody's come forward and it's been 70 years 70 plus years so yeah 
that's it for today's video for tier two. Uh, there's some really interesting things in here, some really weird things in here. Uh, overall, this is like you're still scraping the top of the iceberg. Tier three is when we start getting a little bit deeper. Um, but it, it, obviously the, there are nine tiers to this. So by tier nine, you're going to start hearing me talk about some very interesting topics. Uh, a lot of them are going to kind of go back to like unit 731 where they're going to be uh, heavy topics. So if you're not prepared for that, uh, obviously I'm going to end up doing what I did with that, which is telling you, hey, there's timestamps. Uh, if you want to skip it, you can skip it if you want. Um, Again, I know I said that this is all, all of these are going to go on to my second channel, but I decided against that. And instead, I'm just going to compile all of the stuff. Like, I'm going to compile all of these videos into one video, and I'm going to upload that onto my second channel. Just because I would rather have a channel where all of, like I, I compile things like that. Because I definitely want to start doing more series kind of like this. Uh, I had an idea recently of covering uh, a Legend of Zelda iceberg. And it's like a really long iceberg. It is nine tiers. But if you if you look at the picture that is scrolling by of it, you can see there's a lot that I have to discuss. A lot that I have to research. A lot that I have to talk about. And that one will probably be nine hours or so. Which is what I am... I kind of estimate this one will end up being uh, without, you know, this whole section of me uh, talking. Uh, but yeah, regardless, um, that's my plan for the future is to start doing more stuff like this. Uh, I'm definitely going to try to stick to gaming every now and then. Uh, I'm still working on a cyberpunk video that I've been working on for a few months. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> that's where I want to end that um, again thank you so much for watching if you stuck around to the very end of this video uh, I thank you a lot um, bye